Welcome, everyone. My name is David Ciccone. I'm an associate professor of political science here at George Washington University and co-director of ONARS, which is sponsoring the first New Voices on Eurasia speaker of the new year. So welcome, everyone, for coming out on a thawing Tuesday afternoon to uh, hear a very exciting talk from one of the region's top scholars in Ukraine. So. Just to give you a little introduction about the series, well, Ponars Eurasia is a network of over 140 academics working on the wider Eurasia region. Most of the academics are based in either North America or Eurasia, and they span just about every single discipline, political science, economics, sociology, and technology. We sponsor this monthly series to highlight the best and the brightest work coming out from the next generation of scholars working on the region. And I think I'm thrilled today that we're crossing disciplinary boundaries, like we try to every single year by having sociologists. Uh, we have, we try to mix it up and not just have a bunch of political scientists talking to you about regime change and democratization. And uh, we're thrilled to have uh, Emma Mateo here from Columbia University to share her work on protests in uh, Ukraine. Emma is a postdoctoral doc scholar at the Harriman Institute. Um, we've done a lot of exciting work using a lot of exciting data social media and protest participation. She works a lot with a lot of good friends of mine and has published in some of the top journals already um, on Ukraine and in Belarus. And we're just really thrilled to get another perspective on the events on the ground right now in Ukraine. If you've been to these talks before, then you know that we're gonna give the floor to Emma for about 30 to 40 minutes um, to <clears> the presentation. And then we're gonna open it up to question and answer from all of you. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback and your thoughts on the presentation, including from our online audience which is joining us hopefully from around the world. So thank you very much for coming and please join me in welcoming Emma Mateo. Oh, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully that's the only thing that goes wrong. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm a Petra Yatsik postdoctoral research scholar in Ukrainian studies at the Harriman Institute. Um, at Columbia, and I'm going to be talking about the role of um, civilians in Ukraine. Probably, you probably already know. So, I'm thoroughly convinced that this is an incredibly important topic to talk about. If we want to understand Ukraine's so called unexpected and continued resistance to Russian uh, aggression and invasion, it's really crucial that we consider the role uh, that civilians are playing specifically as non-combatants. So I'm not gonna be talking about the role civilians play by mobilizing into the military, but I'm talking about the roles they play um, continuing to live peacefully. So we know that Ukrainians are engaging in the war effort in very large numbers. So thanks to survey data um, gathered by the Mobilize Project, um, which is um, the PI is Professor Olga Onok at the University of Manchester, Manchester and they've been um, surveying the Ukrainian population. And we know that around 80% of Ukraine's population are engaging in the war effort in some way. So large numbers, around 60% or so, are donating funds. Um, around 40% are volunteering in the community, which is a very large number and means a variety of things, which I'll talk about today. And then, of course, smaller percentages engaging in um, things such as civil resistance or joining the military or volunteering in territorial defense. But this is these are very large numbers participating. And we also know that civilians are engaging throughout the country. So this was another project I was involved in, um, Data for Ukraine, which involves a lot of researchers. I encourage you to check out the website. And we were um, working with almost real-time Twitter data to map um, a number of different phenomena that were happening in Ukraine, including civilian resistance. So you can see in this week of the 15th to 19th of April 2022, in almost every single oblast center in, a oblast in Ukraine, um, some kind of civilian resistance right so not only are very large numbers engaging in the war effort but they're engaging throughout the country so why does all of this matter well first and foremost ukraine it appears is quite a critical case in terms of these high levels of sustained civilian participation in the war effort. it is perhaps an outlier um if we compare it to other countries experiencing interstate conflict or, or others experiencing civil war this is also quite an interesting social science puzzle Right, for the social scientists amongst us. So what motivates and facilitates these high levels of engagement? And how does it vary across the country? And what might shape this variation? That's something I'm particularly interested in. And lastly, because we're in DC after all, for kind of the policy world and um, broader kind of relevance of this, it's really crucial that we consider the role civilians play when we're discussing peace and reconstruction. 
and also in ensuring that the provision of military and humanitarian support is, is effective. We need to account for the role of students. So today I'm going to give a little bit broader context of civic engagement in Ukraine based on my PhD research that looks at various protest movements. And I'm going to move on to talk about some of the different ways in which civilians are contributing to the war effort. And this is mostly drawing on field work I did in Ukraine last summer. Then I'm going to talk about some of the analysis I have on what motivates this civilian engagement based on both quantitative and qualitative data. And then I'll wrap up by talking about some of the broader implications of this engagement in the war effort, including in policy terms. So it's really crucial to note that these high levels of engagement did not emerge from no way. If you're somebody who's been studying Ukrainian society or protests for a long time, then these high levels of mobilization we saw following February 24th, 2022 were not a really big surprise, though it was still very significant. Ukraine has a strong history um, of an active civil society and social mobilization in times of crisis. And this was what I was really working on in my PhD research, highlighting this history of nationwide mobilization. So not only did Ukraine have the highest percentage um, of dissidents per capita amongst um, former Soviet states, um, we also see um, quite a large protest movement taking place in Ukraine um, in the um, fall of 1990, which became known as the Revolution on Ground. So um, in the late summer into September of 1990, Ukraine was still part of the Soviet Union, but there were a lot more open discussions happening about independence. And we see actually a number of um, democratic movements, national democratic parties, um, student organizations, organizing rallies and protests and meetings all the way throughout the country. Um, and all of this culminated in um, a large gathering and then the start of a student hunger strike, which these photos are from, um, which took place on um, what is now Independence Square at the time was put on. Um, and you can see, these are all places that saw some kind of mobilization or meeting or protest in the run up. And we can see that the protests were more frequent and they were also larger, although that's represented on this map in central and western Ukraine. But we're still seeing some kind of nationwide organization at this early stage. And this movement did seek in gaining some concessions from the government, such as the prime minister resigning and a few other um, significant things which moved Ukraine onto its and then 10 years later, um, Ukraine is now a democracy, albeit, of course, an imperfect one. And we saw we see um, a significant protest movement um, against the then President Kuchma, which took place in the winter of 2000, 2001. So Ukrainians again mobilized against the country to protest um, what they saw as democratic backsliding in, under President Kuchma's reign. Um, this was also really the spark for this were, um, was the release of some audio recordings which implicated President Kuchma in the um, kidnapping and murder of the um, French Party journalist Georgi Gongadze. And once again, we see um, the largest protests in the center of Kiev, of course, but meetings and protests and tent camps being set up throughout Ukraine, um, including quite interesting coalitions of different actors and parties actually working together at this movement. I think it was you know, Odessa, the Greens were there, the Communists were there, the, the National Democrats were there. This was a very interesting movement. Unfortunately, it wasn't successful in unseating Kuchma. It was crushed by um, kind of repression and some internal divisions, but there were some important networks formed and lessons learned in the, the very start of the new millennium, um, which then played an important role in the Orange Revolution. So this is probably more familiar to a lot of folks in the room. Some of you perhaps even remember um, seeing these images or maybe even participated. Um, the Orange Revolution in 2004 saw um, a very large number of Ukrainians, millions, um, protesting against falsified elections. And what happened in the center of Kiev is very well known. This is, of course, where the largest protests took place. But what's slightly lesser known is the fact that some kind of protest took place in every single regional capital across Ukraine. Again. I want to be clear, they were not as large as they were in Kiev, they were not as frequent, and there was some nationwide um, difference in terms of size and frequency, but this was already a nationwide movement of organizations happening throughout the country. And then most recently, the Euromaidan, which later became known as the Revolution of Dignity, um, saw protests take place in at least 64 towns and cities across Ukraine during that winter of 2013 to 2014. 
Um, the true number is actually much higher than this, um, but my methods that I use rely um, on media reports and media report less on kind of smaller and more local um, protests. So this is kind of an ongoing project to keep working on this data set and improving it. Um, but already at the time of the Euromaidan, we have this nationwide, you know, a really significant nationwide protest movement um, taking place. And of course, a lot of this fed into then mobilization um, to support volunteers and the military um, when the war um, against Russia-backed separatists started in, in the east of Ukraine um, in the spring of 2018. So it's really important to take in mind this broader context um, when we're searching civilian engagement. In Ukraine, this is not a flash in the pan. This is something that is um, drawing on longer term experiences and networks, but um, nonetheless does present a significant shift. So my current research, this kind of book project that's the focus of my postdoctoral research and also whatever comes next for me, um, is really focusing what civilian engagement looks like following the onset of Russia's force-scale in nature. I'm also interested in what motivates this engagement and how this might vary across Ukraine. So the book project, is drawing on interviews and field work that I conducted in Ukraine and this past summer. And I'm really interested specifically um, in three cities, Bakhmut, Chernihiv, and Nipro, um, because these three cities all experienced quite a high level of threats when full-scale invasion began, but they all then experienced, um, actually experienced different levels of threat and the, the war unfolded for them in different ways. So um, in Nipro, there was a lot of concern that the city would be very heavily targeted, but and then in actual fact, um, was one of the least impacted in the south and east regions of Ukraine. Chernihiv very quickly was com almost completely blockaded and surrounded by Russian forces, although it was not occupied, and it was blockaded for 38 days, which created very specific circumstances there. And then Bakhmut, initially, there was not too much panic when the war broke out because people had already experienced war on their doorstep for a very long time. But then, as we know, unfortunately, Bakhmut becomes almost completely destroyed and uninhabitable. So I did field work in Chernihiv and Dnipro and also in Kiev. I was not able to go to Bakhmut for obvious reasons, but I was interviewing people who were displaced from work. Um, but because this project is ongoing and my conclusions are preliminary, I'm also going to be referencing two other papers I'm working on, which are nearing completion. Um, so I have one which uses the mobilized survey data, which I referenced at the beginning of my talk and with Professor Olga Onuf, um, and also a paper which analyzes interviews with displaced people which, collect, which were collected in the spring and summer of 2022. And this is part of a fantastic project which is led by Dr. Natalia Vyshenko at the Center for Urban History in Lviv. So I'm kind of referencing a few different pieces of research today, but they all are helping to contribute to our understanding of this broader theme. So I'm not going to go too deeply into the theory because I think we have quite a lot of like disciplines and backgrounds here, but this is not just about researching Ukraine for Ukraine's sake, although of course um, Ukraine is incredibly important right now. Um, I'm also contributing to the broader literature on um, civilian non-combatant roles during wartime. So a lot of research um, on what happens to civilians and how they react in wartime tends to focus either on decisions to flee, so displacement, um, or to take up arms and become military actors. Um, we are seeing a bit of a shift as scholars increasingly highlight different ways that civilians engage in war, um, highlighting civilians' agency a little bit more. So there's some researcher, Van Balen, looks at um, participation in demonstrations against military aggression, um, and um, Barta also talks about the different ways in which civilians can support military actors. Um, but there's still kind of much to be unpacked in the literature about the diversity of civilian roles and during times of war and also who engages in these different forms and why. So let me get to the meaty stuff um, and talk about some of these different civilian engagements. So probably the most significant and the most obvious and the one that most of you will have heard of are different forms of military support. So civilians are playing a very significant role, although of course it's hard to quantify in providing support for Ukraine's armed forces. Um, first of all, they are playing um, a very widespread role in the provision of mostly non-lethal military items. Um, so medical supplies um, are crucial. There are constant, constant um, fundraisers and work on going to secure things like tourniquets and chest seals, like tactical um, first aid supplies, as well as more kind of banal and everyday things like antifungal foot cream, antibiotics, cough medicine, things like that. Um, and these couple 
that pictures here are this is a larger organization this is a small organization that was actually operating in Bathmort and then moved to the row and these are boxes full of tourniquets and chair seals and all kind of mostly military supplies we also see civilian organizations of varying sizes so um established ngos small volunteer networks independent volunteers um, undertaking actions to provide the military with clothing. So particularly in the early days of the full-scale invasion, there was a lot of work to either get hold of things like balaclavas and warm clothing, or if you couldn't get hold of them, to sew them, right? Um, this has shifted a little bit now, um, as the um, Ukrainian state is doing a better job of being able to supply uniform as this conflict's ongoing. Um, but there's still somewhat of a role where we're seeing um, civilian organizations collectively providing additional clothing needs um, for units. And also things like equipment as well, and particularly specialized equipment, things that are really expensive, things like um, thermal vision goggles, drones, right? So this brings me um, to talking about how we're seeing volunteer groups in civil society playing a really key role in the provision of certain specialist items. And this is a little bit similar to what we saw happening in 2014-15. Um, so at the start of the war um, in Eastern Ukraine, volunteers were providing basically everything because the state was taken really unawares. And then over time, the volunteers shift to more specialized things um, because the state is kind of catching up and providing for the basic needs. So now, you know, Again, volunteer groups of varying sizes from quite large NGOs and civil society organizations down to like individuals on their social media places or, or informal networks are playing a really crucial role in things like um, buying and getting out drones or even making drones. There's this campaign now for civilians to actually put together drones. Um, and with the provision of four by four vehicles. So there's a particularly interesting pipeline from my home country, the UK, of buying up four by four vehicles and driving them across Europe and getting them in the hands of military units. That have so the photos here are a few examples of this. Another thing that I didn't talk about yet is um, there's a very widespread practice that is quite informal um, of um, civilians joining together to make camouflage nets. So this was taking place in an industrial estate that had been an industrial building that had been denoted by a local business and people could kind of join up this telegram channel and then turn out for the various ships to the camouflage nets. And apparently I was told that actually a lot of the military units prefer these hand-woven nets because they're better quality than um, the kind of cheap bulk ones that you buy from China. Um, and then also other things like the making of um, trench candles. So this is also quite a widespread practice and then they're often collected by these organizations or informal kind of volunteer networks and distributed. People can make these trench candles using wax and cardboard and old cans in their homes. And they, they're good at, and they can even heat food in the trenches. Um, there, there's so many different ways in which civilians are supporting the military. I want to emphasize this is not an exhausting, exhaustive list, but I'm going to talk about two more ways. Um, so another interesting avenue is the provision of specialist items and support for injured service personnel. So some of you have maybe even heard of like Superhumans, which is a very big, quite well-known organization. But this has also happened at very local decentralized levels. So this photo from the top right is from a warehouse in Chernihiv, and where they were collecting uh, mobility aids, which were being passed on to um, hospitals and soldiers who needed them. And um, there's like wheelchairs and, and Zimmer frames and crutches. Um, and another really interesting and quite creative example is this one in the top center. And this is actually started out with a couple of women um, who were part of the same sewing club in Dnipro and um, who started sewing adaptive clothing for injured soldiers. So this is a t-shirt and um, a pair of underwear and a pair of kind of pajama bottoms, which can almost completely, which can be completely open and separated out into two different pieces. And they've kind of figured out themselves and innovated this. And this is, this means that soldiers who are recovering who have large casts or large frames on their limbs are able to actually wear a normal t-shirt or wear a normal pair of trousers and go out onto the street or see their family without being in a towel or a hospital gown and this is very interesting because it started out with a small group and now there's actually um small groups of women throughout ukraine who are who are doing this as part of like a wider network and it's very important um volunteers and civilians are also um working to provide home quality kind of home cooked food and treats. And um, this was particularly noticeable in the Pro as kind of like a hub relatively close to the front lines. So um, these two images here in the top left and then the bottom right are from um, a small village just outside of Dnipro. 
um, where some local women set up a hub where they're basically making home cooked meals for soldiers and then they freeze them and then they get up at 4 a.m. to defrost them and heat them up and then the people come from the military units and then they take them and then um, then the troops have got some nice hot stuff, pepper or fresh biscuits um, for lunchtime. And we also, I also spoke to a few people who were doing things like this on a much smaller scale, actually just in their own homes, doing things like fire extinguishing. And then the last form of um, military support I'm going to talk about is something that um, many of you have probably seen is fundraising, which is the support of military. So some of this is very visible even from far away. We've probably all seen like online collections or GoFundMes or the little monobank jars that you can contribute to. But it also gets quite creative. So this is um, Sergei, who was okay with me using his photo. He runs a, a, a Canelay cafe, a French dessert cafe in Denis Pro. And what they actually do is they have these um, used um, military hardware from the front lines. They send it off to get painted with traditional Ukrainian folk art. Um, and then they raffle it off um, in their local football fan club to raise money for a unit they support. So some very creative um, forms of that. We're also seeing civilians providing support for other civilians. So um, one of the most obvious um, instances of this is support for internally displaced people, right? We're seeing volunteer groups, um, again, both more established groups and like local grassroots networks, providing goods, housing and support for displaced people. The top right, this is actually the same warehouse where I showed you the picture of the crutches. They were collecting a lot of clothes in Chernihiv Oblast, so displaced people could come and take whatever clothes that they might need. Um, also providing housing and other forms of support, like psychological support. I spoke to a few, um, a couple of women's organizations who now support women and with setting up their own business or getting into work and doing displacement. We're also seeing civilian groups providing um, for the reconstruction of damaged and destroyed housing. And I saw there's some quite interesting statistics um, I saw recently um, where in some regions, vol voluntary groups are potentially playing a very significant role in the reconstruction of damaged housing, actually in some places, perhaps even more than the state. Um, and this picture is from Chernihiv. So um, for those of you who aren't, who aren't aware, there were some there were some areas of Chernihiv city which were more or less unscathed by, by um, the blockade, um, and then this area on the outskirts, 80% of the buildings were damaged. So this is, um, I interviewed a guy who started out just volunteering on social media to help out people who were reconstructing their homes on the weekends, and then he ended up getting a few friends involved, and now there's a whole organisation that they're created and registered that does this. And this is quite a, a, a familiar pattern, where like somebody starts out doing something at the low level, and then more people get involved as they see the need, and then it becomes a little bit more formalised. Um, the rescue and rehabilitation of animals is another interesting sector. Um, I've spoken to uh, a woman who was displaced from Bakhmut and before the full scale invasion was already in, quite involved in animal rights groups and animal welfare. And now she has been um, evacuating animals from um, frontline areas and is actually working to set up a rehabilitation center and for animals um, in a slightly safer place. Um, blood donation is another very banal um, area where we're seeing civilians playing an important role. So um, I was in Chernihiv when there was a very significant rocket attack, which killed um, people and injured dozens. And within a couple of hours at the, after the um, attack and the local authorities putting out a message on their local telegram channel saying we need blood, there were so many people in the local blood donation centre that the corridors were full, no one else could come in. And they asked anyone who wasn't O rhesus negative, the universal donor type, to go home, right? So very quickly, people are mobilizing to do to do what they can, even on a day when the city had been shelled and there was a risk of potential further um, right? Civilians also playing an important role in evacuating people from occupied and frontline territories. Um, civilians were very involved in this evacu evacuating people where possible out of Chernihiv. Under blockade, they were contacting local businesses, local people who had minibuses, um, and volunteers were actually killed evacuating people out of Chernihiv um, when the bridges were down and, um, and this became a um, very hazardous activity. And the other form of support that I'm gonna kind of wrap up with and then start to talk about motivations is um, the role that civilians were playing, support, were playing supporting other civilians under occupation and block. So 
um, I spoke to a large number of volunteers in Czerny here, but they were absolutely crucial in ensuring people had food and medication and the basic means to survive. In February and March um, 2022, when the city was almost completely occupied, very quickly um, certain food and medical items started to be in short supply and existing volunteer networks were mobilized and started to work together alongside the city council um, to provide for these needs, to evacuate people and to even actually try and count and survey the number of people that were left in the city um, when it got almost completely cut. Oh, sorry, I forgot about this one. I'm gonna talk about cultural resistance and then I'm gonna talk about motivation. So. One more form, which is which is quite interesting, and I still need to do a little bit more work to conceptualize this, um, are the ways in which um, civilians are using Ukrainian culture, both to kind of make a statement about Ukraine's resilience and identity, but also to engage in other forms of support. So Russia's war is genocidal. It seeks to destroy Ukraine as a nation and an, as an identity. Um, so we're seeing individuals and groups working to promote protect and promote Ukrainian cultural heritage and traditions. So these top two photographs um, come from an exhibition um, called Unbreakable Bakhmut, um, which was organized at the Folk Architecture Center when I was there. And how this came about was there's kind of like um, a loose network, like workshop of craft artisans in Bakhmut who had been compiling a large collection of traditional textiles from the region. And they managed to evacuate this, most of this, um, when Bakhmut came under fire and then they managed to regroup and actually put on this exhibition. And it was very important for this group to make the statement that Bakhmut is Ukrainian and has a Ukrainian identity and this won't be destroyed. And interestingly, this group has also put together a, a calendar um, with models modeling these clothes um, and they're selling this to raise money for torn clothes. Um, we see cultural resistance in the protection and restoration of historic buildings. I'm not gonna to talk too much about that for the sake of time. And another interesting thing that we see is the ways this cultural resistance is intersecting with other forms of engagement. So for example, um, therapeutic practices to support displaced people. In the bottom left, this is from a workshop I went to where a woman who was displaced from Bakhmut herself was putting on a workshop making these traditional Ukrainian cloth dolls to other displaced people. Um, and this was kind of a therapeutic space where people could come, come together, get to know one another, and spend a bit of time working with their hands and just being really present in the moment. It was, um, it was, it was quite an extraordinary experience to, to witness that. And um, the same group that say the textiles are also doing things such as um, making and selling these traditional um, motanki cloth dolls in order to um, fundraise for um, so the the other paper that I'm working on using the data from the interviews from the Lviv Center of Urban History um, focuses more on what is happening in occupied and frontline territories. So I just want to talk briefly about that before I move on to talk about motivation. Um, my cities that I'm focusing on for my book project are not cities that experienced all out occupation for, for various reasons that creates quite specific circumstances. But in analyzing these interviews, it was very interesting to note how important support from other civilians was in enabling people to survive in occupied and frontline territories of Ukraine during the very first weeks and months of the, the full-scale invasion. So um, we see people turning to the existing social networks for information and for accessing resources needed to sustain life, such as shelter and food and water during evacuation. And getting into what this actually looks like in a bit more detail, there seems to emerge a pattern where when people find themselves under occupation or bombardment, their first recourse are their families and friends. So what we would call strong ties in sociological literature. This isn't a particularly surprising uh, finding necessarily, but nonetheless, it's there. But of course, the onset of conflict is an extremely disruptive incident, which meant that a lot of people were cut off from their immediate social networks. Um, they physically couldn't reach them, right? Even if they were just down the street or in the same city, or they were cut off in terms of communication, right? The internet was down, the phone lines were down. So we see people turning to their weaker ties, their people in the immediate vicinity, such as their neighbors, um, their acquaintances. And we see a lot reported in these interviews, for example, a lot of folks from the same tower block coming out into the garden and setting up their needs to cook and gather water and actually have some kind of food and sustenance by working together when you know the water had gone out and the gas lines were down, so you could and then what's even more interesting, if you're a little bit familiar with this kind of mobilization and protest literature, 
which really tends to emphasize the importance of pre-existing social network ties, is really widely reported in these interviews are instances of absolute strangers helping one another, um, particularly at their own cost and risk, right? So when you can't reach out to the people that you know already, when there are limited means to get out of a, a bombarded city or an occupied city, um, people are helping each other one out. Uh, one another out with, with information, with resources, with food, with evacuation. Um, one particularly striking example of this was a, um, a young man who managed to get out of Mariupol and he managed to evacuate. He got to Zaporizhia. He spent a couple of days in Zaporizhia, like resting, and then he got his car cleaned and then he drove back to Zap Mariupol to evacuate more people. Um, and he, he got shot at and, and despite he persisted doing a few evacuation runs, mostly to evacuate people that he did not know whatsoever. So, and what's particularly interesting is what's absent from these accounts in these very early stages of the full scale invasion, the Ukrainian state was really taken by surprise, right? So the state wasn't necessarily providing for some of these needs and also international humanitarian agencies and you know aid agencies or humanitarian organizations were not really present in these spaces at this time. So actually civilians helping one another was very significant in helping people survive. So um, in this civilian engagement, I've given you quite a lot of descriptive information because um, I'm still working through this project, but there's already some kind of trends and themes starting to emerge. So first of all, I hope I've given you an indication that civilian forms of engagement appear to be happening across almost every imaginable sector. Right. Feel free to ask me if there's nothing I haven't spoken about. I don't know every single thing that's happening, but it's very widespread and very diverse um, to things that civilians are doing. And what also really comes through in interviews is that this is often drawing on existing skills and past experience, albeit sometimes expanding to new sectors. So the women who were making adaptive clothing, they were already part of a sewing club. The woman who set up um, uh, this little hub cooking food for the troops, um, she said she was good at cooking. Right. I spoke to a guy who said, you know, I'm not a military man, but I've got a car and a drive and I can drive. So I volunteered to evacuate. Um, so people using these existing skills to make their contribution. to them. Um, there's interesting dynamics in terms of the engagement of civilian actors with the state um, and often the state at the local level. Right. Alexandra Koydal, who's in the audience, has some great research on um, what the local state is doing. Um, and when I was speaking to people, it was quite varied. In some instances, we saw civilian actors outright working with the state, such as in Chernihiv, they were working quite closely with the city council during occupation, uh, during the siege, that changed a bit afterwards. In some places, they're kind of topping up or filling in for the state. Um, in some, some people I spoke to, they didn't really want anything to do with the local government. And there are definitely some nationwide commonalities emerging in this civilian engagement. But what I also saw in speaking to people from these three different cities were um, the forms of engagement were responding to the local needs and the local situation, right? So um, what people were doing in Dnipro to support the military and to support displaced people looked quite different, for example, to what was happening in Chernihiv to support the population um, during blockade. And again, what was happening in Bahamut was quite different um, because of the, the level of bombardment that was taking place. But this is something that I'm going to be continuing to unpack as I work. So what's motivating all of this response at the population level? Um, if we look at this survey data from the Mobilize project, I'm just going to give you a little sneak peek here. I will explain that graph for anyone scared by quantum methods. Um, this paper I'm working on with Olga Ono, um, which I'm happy to go into a bit more detail in the Q&A, indicates that as well so, as some of the usual demographic factors we might anticipate, so for example, people who um, are um, better educated, who are younger, who are perhaps wealthier, maybe are more likely on average to engage in um, the war effort. What's quite interesting here are towards the bottom, that this engagement in the war effort is also associated with strong support for democracy. So believing that um, democracy is the best system and also having a strong sense of civic duty, right? So believing you have a duty to vote in the elections, believing you have a duty to participate in politics beyond voting. Um, so there's something interesting happening here where by these people who are engaging in the war effort are also people with a strong sense of civic duty and are perhaps motivated by this sense of duty and um, a desire to safeguard democracy. And this is also what really came through in my kind of more in-depth, detailed interviews. So these were not the people who were surveyed, but these are the interviews that, that I conducted this summer. And quite a few times I was 
I was told in response to my question, you know, why did you do this? Why did you decide to stay and engage? Well, if not me, then who, right? If not us, then who? So a very strong sense of kind of intrinsic um, duty amongst people who are engaging in this kind of civilian action. And bearing in mind that these are very, these were quite dangerous places, right? Where I was speaking with people who um, had decided to stay under quite dangerous conditions and high levels of risk. And an idea of feeling like there was a necessity to contribute to the war. And this often came hand in hand with a desire to contribute by using existing skills and knowledge. Um, so I would speak to people and they would explain, well, I can't join the military or I can't do this or I don't know how to do this, but I can sew, I can cook, I can drive. We have this organization, I can work with animals, right? So this orientation of existing skills and knowledge um, in order to contribute to the war effort. And we see this both at the individual level and also at the kind of organizational level. So when I spoke to people from more formal organizations, they had often been doing something a little bit different before the full-scale invasion or very different. Um, for example, um, women's organizations that used to support um, uh, women's rights, um, now orienting towards supporting displaced women um, to find a livelihood to support their family. Um, yeah, and multiple other examples. And the last thing to note about this mobilization is there seems to be a strong element of it happening via existing um, networks or ties between them. So very often existing organizations or groups of friends or informal networks that had been active during the Euromaidan protests, they were mobilizing or reconnecting and deciding to work together um, to, make their, to make their contribution to support the military. And support. But what's also interesting that comes through is when I spoke to people who hadn't been active in this kind of civic action or protest or the war effort before 2022, they were also mobilized by their existing ties after the full scale invasion started. So they would say things to me like, I really wanted to get involved. And I saw my friend on Facebook was involved in this local volunteer organization. So I reached out to them and, and asked what I could do. Or I saw these people doing this thing. So I decided to help. Or I knew they needed drivers. Um, my friends needed drivers to evacuate people from the city. So, um, so I decided to get involved. So these pre-existing networks and ties are very important in mobilizing people, it appears. And then of course, these networks are growing and expanding and developing over the course of the full scale invasion and providing a an incredible way of, of getting things done and finding needed resources. So as I move towards wrap up, I wanna make a few points about civilian engagement and resilience, and then finish with some kind of more policy relevant points. So um, this picture is from kind of like a stuck on street art graffiti in an underpass in Chernihiv, and it says, um, we will build again. It's a picture of a building that was um, was damaged, badly damaged in the center of Chernihiv. Um, that is in the process of kind of being stabilized for reconstruction. Um, and I thought it was quite relevant for civilian resistance, especially as this happened to another building in Chernobyl this summer. So whilst it's very difficult to quantify exactly what impact all of this civilian engagement and organization is having, undoubtedly civilian engagement is contributing towards Ukraine's resilience, right? Whilst the counteroffensive this summer did not have the results that a lot of people would have hoped for. Nonetheless, Ukraine is continuing to resist and um, withhold its territory from a much bigger civilian actor and civilian engagement is playing a role in this. But it's really also very important to note something that I saw come through in my interviews was that civilian engagement in the war effort may also be supporting resilience and well-being at the individual level. So I spoke to a few people who said to me, well, if I wasn't doing this, then I don't know how I would cope. If I wasn't doing this, I probably would have left my hometown or I would have left you. And even a couple of people who said to me, this is going to sound really weird, but the start of the war was the best and the worst time of my life because I saw the best of humanity and how we could work together to help one another. So this is something that needs a little bit more unpacking and probably also needs psychologists to get involved in this. But there's perhaps something here about by engaging in the war effort, ordinary people are giving themselves a sense of power and agency in an incredibly, you know, fraught and stressful and traumatic time. But it's also crucial to acknowledge that while this is, you know, very uplifting and inspiring and interesting to talk about the ways ordinary people are contributing to the war effort, 
we need to acknowledge that the war is ongoing and the risks of trauma and burnout are only increasing. A lot of people are doing this kind of thing on top of their full-time job or in addition to raising a family um, with sirens in the background and bombs falling and not getting a full night's sleep. So we need to be very aware um, that this is potentially having a toll on people's you know, emotional and physical health and their, their families and their jobs. So I want to finish up with some broader policy relevance and implications at the request of the PONARS folks, because, you know, we are also uh, uh, a network that thinks about policy and broader relevance. So taking into account all this diversity of activity, we know that there is so much knowledge and resources and skill within Ukrainian civil society and these kind of volunteer groups. So it's crucial to ensure that discussions and planning about reconstruction um, and paths to peace are really taking into account um, what civil society is doing, what skills and resources they have, and also the attitudes of the civilian population. Right? This is a very mobilized population. These mobilized surveys are also showing that willingness to protest is high as well. Um, so if agreements are made and negotiations take place that are not necessarily something that is aligned with the broad majority of the population, we might see Ukrainian civilians pushing. So this is very important. Um, and in terms of reconstruction, there's already some concerns being raised about the ways in which civil society is being excluded from some discussions about reconstruction. Um, it's really crucial that both international actors and also Ukrainian actors are, are working to um, include um, civilians in, in these conversations. It's also really crucial that um, international humanitarian experts, not experts, sorry, actors, um, such as UN agencies, first understand the, the role and the landscape of local civil society. And this is easier said than done because this requires language skills, it requires local contextual knowledge, but it's crucial that these organizations, when they're going into regions of Ukraine, they understand what actors are already doing there, and who is present, what resources they have. Um, so that they're not stepping on toes, so that resources are being used effectively, so that different actors and organizations are used. So doing this will enable humanitarian agencies to utilize the strengths of these local groups. But it's also really important that we don't just end up with um, humanitarian agencies dumping work onto local Ukrainian groups to maybe go into the most dangerous places or deliver aid through the last three miles. Um, but also support the sustainability and capacity building of these groups. So a lot of these organizations are not very well funded. People have been working very hard for a very long time. So we need to think about support to help um, these groups and organizations to access funding, to think about longer term sustainability and how people aren't going to burn out and have to withdraw. And then lastly, I just want to wrap up by acknowledging that Ukrainian society is doing a lot to support the Ukrainian military. And there's every indication they will continue to do so, right? These levels of engagement are still coming through high in these surveys. If anything, they've been increasing in over waves. But many civilian actors are likely working at full capacity already, right? Like a lot of effort and time um, is being put into the war effort and sustained military support is crucial. Um, if international partners are stepping back, Ukrainian society only has so much capacity to step forward and do more because they're already doing so much. So whilst I think it's really important that we recognize the role that civilians are playing in the war effort, we can't let this be some happy story that we tell ourselves that Ukrainians are gonna be okay with our support because um, continued military support is crucial so that the war can end um, um, with as few lives lost and ruined as possible. So thank you very much for being here and for listening. I covered a lot of information, so I'm very happy um, to answer questions and take questions. Thank you. It's our tradition here is that I get the first question. Um, it also give you a chance to breathe as well. Uh, so fantastic talk. I'm, I'm curious in your work, how attitudes to the state, the Ukrainian state have evolved through your research. So in the beginning when the, the state is, relatively weak, it's consumed by, by military tasks, but as time has come on, it has had some infusion of resources and had, how do people feel the distribution of tasks and responsibility should or should not be evolving? And um, is there ever a, you might, I don't wanna get into fatigue or sustainability, but um, where, how have they evaluated the performance of the state providing some of these services? And is there any point where they're just 
kind of fed up with the fact that they still have to volunteer and contribute so much because the state hasn't developed its own capacity to perform some things that in other countries during wartime, a state over time might have adapted to take over. So or people are just kind of autonomous and this is a civil society project and the state is even absent from these conversations mm -hmm. because it's its authority and it's it has to win the war and therefore it shouldn't be expected to, um, to step in in some of these other yeah um yeah that's a really interesting question um this isn't necessarily something i was asking directly about but it did come up but i i do want to emphasize that you know there are people doing survey work on this that's going to be representative um at the kind of international level but while speaking with the volunteers i heard a few different attitudes so um sometimes people would say things like the state should really be doing this but if we don't do it right now, then who's going to do it, right? So there was almost, for some people, there was an acknowledgement that the state should be doing some of these things. And I wish we didn't have to do this, but let's put those kind of ideological concerns to the side right now, because the most important thing is victory, right? So quite a pragmatic approach. Even some people who, you know, their um, like political attitudes or their like political orientation was quite critical of this like neoliberal kind of approach of civilians filling in for the state. They were like, I wish we didn't have to do this, but you know, well, we need to. Um, and, but there is, there was also um, an awareness of the spaces in which the state is making some progress, right? So um, some organizations which were initially providing things that the state wasn't like you know uniforms and warm clothing for soldiers and um, then as they saw the state expand capacity in this area they would actually pivot. so the um women the workshop um which was sewing this adaptive clothing they actually started out by just making like balaclavas and warm clothing and, and camo stuff um and then they realized that the soldiers were being better provided for but nobody's providing adaptive clothing so they kind of moved into this area. thank you so let's open it up to the audience. If you could just please introduce yourself. We have a microphone as well, so please wait for it to come to you. But we're happy to take some questions from everyone, including online, which get relayed to me in real time. So. Alexandra Koydil, Fifth School of Economics. I listened to this fascinating talk, really fascinating. And there were two things that I started thinking about it and maybe you can, I don't know, expand on this. So you mentioned that uh, civil society is helping to do this adaptive clothes and um, look for animals. And there are other things that seem like people want to keep some kind of dignity in this whole situation. Can you maybe elaborate on this? What does it mean for the society that is actually known for having these survival values if we look at this value barometer? And another thing that you mentioned this uh, total strangers coming in again, like what did what does it mean? Because Ukraine is known for low generalized trust, mm -hmm. right? So is it is it the war is just is it something that um the trust has been is being building now, or is it, or maybe we didn't measure it correctly before. So what what does it tell us about it? Yeah, um, there are two great questions. I like that you picked up on the dignity aspect because that was something that um, the the two women who I interviewed about the adaptive clothing really emphasized. Um, and this also kind of comes through in the people who are cooking for the soldiers. There's this idea of you know, we understand this isn't like the absolute basic essentials, but our soldiers, the people fighting for our country, the people who have been injured fighting for our country, they deserve to have proper food. They deserve to not be naked with a blanket over them in, in, in the hospital. Um, you know, and the same thing with animals, like this idea that, you know, a civilized society also takes care of its animals. So um, there is, there is, I mean, this is something that should really be unpacked more, and I'm sure we can have more conversations about this, but there is definitely an element of dignity, right, that we have volunteers and civilians providing for basic needs, but also trying to ensure um, that vulnerable members of society or people fighting for the country have, um, have an element of dignity. This also came up in um, discussions about the provision of like clothing for displaced people, for example. So I spoke to one woman who was... Um, <laughs> wasn't really part of like a, a bigger organization or a network she had set up her own little um 
like they call it like a splad, like a little warehouse um, in her university building. And she had collected a lot of clothes and items for displaced people. And she said, actually, they really prefer to come here because I only have one or two people here at a time and they have a lot more dignity. And it's not so shameful, like going to this big warehouse and queuing up and like pulling clothes out of these boxes. So there's like there's an idea of like maintaining people's dignity in a lot. Um, and with regards to trust, um, I think what seems to come through in these um, interviews um, about people in occupied and frontline territories is it's preferable to first and foremost turn to the people that you know. So whether that's your kind of strongest ties, your nearest and dearest, or people who are like a friend of a friend or you know a little bit. Um, but I think the circumstances sometimes force people to have to turn to people who are complete strangers. Um, and the it kind of did come through in the interviews a few moments, this idea that, you know, there's not quite that same element of trust with total strangers, but we're all in the same situation. So you just have to kind of like, you know, take it with a pinch of salt and just and just trust that things will work out. OK, but I think this idea of trust is very important. And I think that's one of the reasons why so much of this volunteer work and sourcing of resources and like mobilization into these volunteer networks happens through existing ties because if you know somebody or you know somebody who knows somebody there's already a kind of connection there and there's like this bond of trust um and sometimes it's a bit imperfect maybe you don't know this person personally but you know someone who knows someone and that is and that's really important this theme of trust come up quite a lot yes Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Emma. It was a wonderful presentation, amazing uh, topic and phenomena, very important uh, from policymaking perspective, but also analytically. I have a lot of actually uh, reactions and, and uh, questions. So let me try to state some of them. One is I was a bit surprised by your sort of separation between Ukraine's resilience and Ukrainians' individual resilience. I think more interconnections should be sought out um, between collective Ukrainians and individual Ukrainians' resilience, right? You, it's just that you sort of said, you know, like there is Ukraine's resilience, and then look, individually, they also become more resilient when they participate. So that is a bit too contrived, going a little bit into it and looking into the interconnection, I think will be good. The other thing I was thinking about, uh, as of right now, your focus seems to be very much focused on policy relevance, which is absolutely understandable. But then you will be underselling it analytically if you don't bring in comparative aspect. And comparative aspect could come from various directions. One immediate reaction to me was to, um, and you probably, you might not want to go that direction, but you know, as, uh, as uh, someone who looks at the Russian society, uh, I uh, immediately had the reaction of, uh, okay, you know, uh, some degree of uh, civ civic engagement exists among Russians who are doing this and that and doing this and that. And I was thinking it would be interesting to compare both the nature, the scope, the scale, and the differences, potential differences. You might not go in that direction, but analytically it might serve some interesting observations. That's one comparative point. Another comparative point is with a uh, role of war and nation building and to what extent the 19th century Western European nations, you know, with Hobsbawm, he looked at the role of elites in nation building, but to what extent war was looked as a, uh, as, as a, as a moment for state building, but not for nation building. And uh, looking from that perspective, the civic aspect of it comes up really well. Uh, and Ukraine could be looked as, again, with some space uh, allowed. And final point, Mark Berenson has done uh, a number of surveys uh, looking at trust for to the state. And this is back to David's question as well. And there seems to be a really rising uh, evidence of trust to the state. So civic engagement and replacing in certain moments of the state exists alongside trust to the state. And we see that with railroads, with cleaning, with electricity systems, with all the infrastructural systems working really well. 
And um, so maybe that might be for you potentially to talk about because these two might be, um, you know, two sides of the same coin. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I do, in my broader work, I do engage um, like a lot more with like social science and political science theory. I just kind of was light on that today because I thought we've got quite a varied audience in the room. So I'm going to focus on policy relevance. Um, but I have been thinking about the comparative aspect of this because I don't think we, it's really important that we don't take for granted that this this kind of thing only happens in Ukraine, right? Like similar things to this will be happening in Gaza right now. Similar things to this happen in places like Syria and Afghanistan, right? There does seem to be something quite interesting that maybe these levels of civilian engagement are particularly high in Ukraine. And I think that's an interesting question why that is. Maybe it's because Ukraine has this very specific history of high levels of kind of informal civic engagement and um, but I do think in the final book project it would be really interesting to um, touch on a couple of comparative cases maybe. Um, I'm not necessarily sure Russia would be the best one just because I'm particularly interested in civilian engagement in countries that are experiencing war so I actually think something like Syria might be more interesting um, and I've seen some interesting kind of presentations and discussions on that. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to bear in mind this comparative aspect. And with your other um, suggestions on the theory, I'll, I'll definitely look into that. Thank you. Thanks. I'll take one online and then one with the other. So, um, from Tracy, are you seeing civilian volunteers advising in key areas of the government, specifically in the Ministry of Defense arena, where they might have expertise so mm. outside of the kind of localized? Yeah. So I that's kind of isn't the. Uh, the area of my research, right? Like there are other people doing work on this, but we know that this was was already happening before. Um, I'm really blanking on the name of the person who wrote a paper on this. It might have been Katarina Zarembo, um, where there was already an initiative before the full scale invasion where um, Ukrainian volunteers were kind of recruited into um, as, as employees in the defense forces as advisors, right? So this was already happening. And there's also, was it your paper? That was Sasha's paper, everyone, Alexandra Koido, sorry. <laughs> misattributing your work to Katarina Zarembo. My apologies. Okay, okay, so it wasn't completely unfounded. Um, so even before we were seeing um, instances where um, people who started out as volunteers would move maybe into politics or into um, the civil service or the public sector. And I think that, I think my instinct would be that that is very much happening now, if not e even even more than before, but that is that is not a, a new phenomenon. Um, but yeah, um, if that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, please. Okay. Hello, I'm Igor and I'm from the uh, University of California, uh, DC, uh, some of my cohorts. But uh, in terms of research, I was curious about uh, the rural areas, because I'm, I'm assuming you focus just on like three main cities. Uh, but in the rural areas, did you notice that there was like a pull to get out of the rural areas or some type of more uh, concentrated effort to, because from my experience in Ukraine, the rural areas were mostly uh, older people, retired people. Um, and yeah, I guess basically my question, is support civilian support there increasing decreasing more so, or is it just rural areas are becoming concentrated in urban areas? So with regards to the like the movement of people, I can't speak to that. I'm not across like the latest demographics of internal displacement. And my research did really focus on these cities, but I did have one particular day where I met someone who um, then started driving me around all of her friends to, to take interviews, uh, which was essentially like a small village um, outside of Dnipro. And I was very, it was very interesting to see, even in this quite small village, actually, which had limited facilities, um, this, that was actually where the pictures were from, where this, um, this woman had had this um, building that she had been using for her, her business, and then she set up like this cooking, right? Um, so there are very much things happening in rural areas as well. Um, they're perhaps less visible than things that are happening in the cities. They're perhaps a lot more between kind of existing family and friendship networks. But anecdotally, you know, I've heard plenty of stories of, you know, people cooking stuff, cooking things um, like pies and pastries for the armed forces, um, older women knitting socks. Um, yeah, there's 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 definitely things happening in the villages as well um, and the rural areas. And I think that's probably worthy and interesting of, 
um, of more research in itself to be a question. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Hi, um, my name is Kevin. So in terms of the um, defense of the Ukrainian culture, how are they able to um, distinguish or keep their own identity like without um, linking the similarities of Ukrainian and Russian cultures, especially they um, both origin from the same um, medieval um, Rus people? Um. I mean, that's an interesting question in itself, right? Because um, Ukrainian perspective is that Kievan Rus is not the beginning of Russia as a nation. You know, Muscovy is the beginning of the more modern Russian nation. And um, that's, you know, something that could, there could be a longer conversation about. I think Ukraine already has some very clearly distinct um, folk traditions, um, musical traditions, like writers, literary canon, poetry, um, from Russia, there are some similarities in some of these things. Like if you look at Ukrainian and Russian folk art, there are, you know, there's there's some kind of similarities as there are with a lot of um, regions in, in Eastern Europe, the same with some elements of Polish and Ukrainian folk culture. But there was already a certain revival of Ukrainian culture and identity um, off the back of the Euromaidan that happened in 2013 to 14. So already at that time, you were seeing more people wearing traditional Russian um, Ukrainian clothing, sorry, like Vishivankas, um, people becoming more attached to um, like Ukrainian poets and rediscovering literature and stuff like that. So this kind of trend that was already taking place has really accelerated even more. Um, and, you know, for to, to the outside observer, maybe some of these things look similar but for ukrainians it's very you know it's very clear and distinct like what what these traditions and these um and what these elements of, of ukrainian culture are. well thank you very much for a fantastic talk thank you one more time <laughs> thank you for having me. please join us next month we've got three more talks this semester about a variety of different topics so there'll be an email blast in the next week or two but we look forward to seeing you back on new voices in eurasia and Great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.